Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Paul Tanner, who died recently at the age of 95, and Paul Tanner was a musician with a somewhat familiar story with an interesting twist. Paul Tanner played the trombone, and he played the trombone during the big band era. He actually played in Glenn Miller's orchestra, which was the most famous orchestra of the big band era until Glenn Miller was killed in a plane crash in 1944 over the English Channel. In fact, he was the last surviving member of the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Glenn Gray, one of Tanner's later colleagues at UCLA, talks about Tanner's time with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. He was discovered playing in a sort of a strip joint (laughs) while he was playing with his brothers in a family band. They were talking to Glenn Miller and they said, come over and hear this kid on the trombone. So Glenn came over and said, well, uh, I've heard you. How soon can you come with me? (laughs) And Paul Tanner said back, I can come right now. I told him I was all packed. Actually, I just had my toothbrush in my pocket and everything, so I went with him that night. And I stayed with him until he broke the band up in September of 1942. What kind of a man was Glenn Miller? Ooh, that, that takes up a chapter. He was an excellent musician. Uh, he was an excellent businessman. He was very fair. He was very hardworking, Me. you know. So uh, he wouldn't ask you to do anything that he wouldn't do himself, that kind of thing. And he was the boss. Paul would play the high parts, but he could also fit in the middle of the section, too. But, you know, the Glenn Miller Band was kind of perfection at that time, so uh, I think he was part of that total group effort. After Miller died, the orchestra was taken over by band leader Tex Beneke. But the problem was, after World War II, the big band era was dying out. In the early 1950s, he played the trombone in the movie about Glenn Miller's life, The Glenn Miller Story, starring Jimmy Stewart and June Allison. This this particular tune was the love theme from The Glenn Miller Story. It is called Too Little Time, Too Little Time. And here's Mr. Paul Tanner. To do it for you. Take it in the middle, will you, Paul? There you go. Whatever you say, go. Yeah, I think that's about right. It's your band. <laughs> it's your horn. That song was written by Henry Mancini, and in the 1950s, Paul Tanner sort of hooked up with Henry Mancini and a lot of other jazz cats on the West Coast. He started playing jazz, as so many of the big band guys did after the big band era died out. He was a versatile musician, so he had a lot of gigs. He was an arranger and composer for some of the classical musicians, including Eugene Ormandy, Leonard Bernstein, and Andre Previn. And he was the first trombonist for the ABC television network for 16 years in Los Angeles. And in addition, he taught music and music composition at UCLA. So we had a lot of good gigs in the 1950s. But eventually, jazz lost its cachet, too, in the early 60s as rock and roll came in. So you had a lot of these great musicians from the 40s and the 50s who played in the big bands, who played jazz. And they were basically stranded when rock and roll took over, especially after 1964 when the Beatles hit the scene. But Paul Tanner was nothing if not versatile, and his ace in the hole was an instrument called the theremin. The theremin had been invented in the 1920s by a Russian, Leon Theremin, and it basically consisted of an audio oscillator and an amplifier inside a wooden or metal housing, and you could play it by waving your hands close to, but not touching, two antennas. One control the volume and the other control the pitch. If you move your hands closer or farther apart, you could get a lot of different orchestral sounds. Here's Leon Theremin demonstrating the instrument in the late 1920s. It helps if you speak Russian here. Sorry, I don't, but you get the idea. Electromusical instrument Theremin Hox is the first instrument of this type. This is a voice instrument. In it, the управление of the melody is achieved by the influence of the electromagnetic field around the instrument. Mm-hmm. 
little aside here, most people don't know this, but Leon Theremin, besides being a mechanical genius, also worked for the KGB, and he invented a device that was planted in the Great Seal that the Soviet Union gave to the United States to hang in their embassy in Moscow after World War II. So they basically had a bugging device in the United States Embassy in the ambassador's office for seven years before it was accidentally discovered, and that was invented by Leon Theremin. I digress. The Theremin could give you a good spooky sound, and everybody knows about it because of the 1951 movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, when Bernard Herrmann, who composed the music for Psycho, by the way, and Lionel Newman, father of Randy Newman, put it into the movie. Here they are rehearsing the theremin for The Day the Earth Stood Still. These guys were two musical geniuses, by the way. <laughs> Thirty-four, ST, seventeen, and eighteen. Feel quiet now, everywhere. Okay, so they use this theremin in spooky movies, and in the 1960s they started using it in cheesy television shows, including my favorite Martian, whenever Ray Walston would put his antenna up for Bill Bixby. And it was used in the intro to the even cheesier Lost in Space by Irwin Allen. <laughs> That's where Paul Tanner comes back in. Brian Wilson was probably watching those television shows, but he was also working on his masterpiece Pet Sounds and a song that didn't make it into Pet Sounds, but is probably his greatest composition for the Beach Boys, Good Vibrations. He decided he wanted a theremin player, and even with all those great musicians from the Wrecking Crew, no one knew how to play a theremin. And on top of that, since you didn't actually touch the instrument, it was hard to reproduce the sound reliably the same way every time. But Paul Tanner, about eight years before that, and a television repairman friend of his named Bob Whistle, had invented an instrument called the electrotheremin, which was basically a theremin that had mechanical controls that you could adjust by hand. Paul Tanner used the same principles he used for playing trombone, and he happened to be the right man at the right place when Brian Wilson called. And so he played on this record where more people heard him than all his other music throughout his whole life put together. <laughs> Good vibrations. Brian Wilson loved him and he went on to play a couple more songs for the Beach Boys with the Electro Theremin. But eventually the Moog synthesizer came in and took over for the Electro Theremin. Paul Tanner never made a bunch of money on his invention and he eventually sold it to hospitals to use as a hearing test. Paul Tanner's story is the story of the great musician, the big band trombonist, who had a brief but splendid moment in rock and roll history. We're going to move on and close with Lieutenant Colonel James Murray, who died recently at the age of 94.
and Lieutenant Colonel Murray was one of the heroes of the Battle of the Midway Islands, the most important battle between the United States and Japan in World War II in the Pacific Theater. Lieutenant Colonel Murray was one of the first pilots nearly shot down in the first hours of the attack on June 4, 1942. A little background on the Battle of Midway. After the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, the Japanese pretty much controlled the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia, and for six months, basically nothing they did went wrong, and they only grew stronger. They successfully attacked Singapore and the Philippines, and the British were threatened by Japanese forces approaching India via Burma. In the Pacific against the United States, Admiral Yamamoto, who was the mastermind of the Pearl Harbor attack, and his main commander, Nagumo, feeling confident, took another bold gamble. Although it was widely successful, the attack on Pearl Harbor had not completely disabled the United States Navy. Yamamoto's thinking was, if they could seize the Midway Islands, they had a chance to attack Hawaii and knock the United States out of the Pacific so that the United States would have to launch their entire attack from the western continental United States. This would basically preclude any American offensive in Yamamoto fear with the advantage of secrecy he could attack the American fleet head-on. They could basically disable the United States Navy and render it defenseless for the rest of the war. Yamamoto did not know that the United States had broken the Japanese diplomatic code at Pearl Harbor in 1941 didn't prevent the attack because they had not broken the military code. But by June of 1942, the United States had broken the Japanese military code, and they realized that a feint towards the Aleutian Islands was merely a bluff, and the main action would be near Midway Island with the four main Japanese aircraft carriers, the Akagi, the Kaga, the Hiryu, and the Soryu, the cream of the Japanese fleet. Lieutenant Colonel Murray was operating from a fleet of bombers that took off from Midway Island in concert with the naval fleet. He was part of the Army Air Force, which later became the Air Force. And on the morning of June 4th, in first two rounds of flying, attacking the Japanese fleet, they suffered tremendous losses from Japanese Zeros. Like others, Miri was nearly shot down, but they acted as a decoy so that American bombers flying at 18,000 feet were unmolested by the low-flying Zeros and basically could attack the Japanese fleet at will. Here's a brief report on the Battle of Midway. Japan's June 1942 attack on Midway Island was designed to lure the Navy's Pacific fleet into a trap. But instead, it was the Americans who waited to spring a trap on the Japanese Navy. A U.S. Naval Intelligence team under Lieutenant Commander Joseph Rochefort had tricked the Japanese into revealing their code name for Midway, tipping off Admiral Chester Nimitz that an attack was coming. Nimitz moved his carriers, the Yorktown, Enterprise, and Hornet, northeast of Midway and waited for Japan to strike. Rear Admiral Frank Fletcher commanded the carrier force, taking personal command of Task Force 17. Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance commanded Task Force 16. As Japanese planes from four carriers were attacking Midway, Fletcher and Spruance launched their planes after the Japanese ships had been discovered. When Japan's Admiral Nagumo discovered the presence of the American ships, he knew he must change his plans and attack them directly. But Nagumo made a fateful decision waiting until he had recovered all of his planes from the Midway raid so he could mount a balanced attack against the U.S. carriers. To recover, refuel, and rearm the Japanese planes would take about two hours, time the U.S. Navy pilots would put to good use. Despite Japan's blunder, the U.S. counterattack nearly ended in disaster. The American pilots became separated en route, and when they arrived at their destination, the Japanese carriers were not in sight. But the American squadron commanders took the initiative to find the elusive enemy, even though it presented great risk. Fuel was running low, and many of the planes had become separated. Lieutenant Commander Wade McCluskey, commanding a group of bombers from the Enterprise, headed in the direction he believed the carriers had gone, even though it meant pushing many of his planes beyond the point of no return. Torpedo Squadron 8 from the Hornet was the first to find the Japanese ships, but without their fighter escort, they stood little chance against the faster Zeros. Despite their heroic effort, all 15 U.S. planes were shot out of the sky before they could inflict any damage on the Japanese carriers. Torpedo bombers from the Enterprise and Yorktown arrived next and met a similar fate. Only six of the 41 U.S. Devastator bombers survived the attack. With its ships unharmed, Japan appeared close to a great and decisive victory, but then the tide of battle turned in an instant. At 10.25 a.m., McCluskey's dive bombers arrived at 18,000 feet. The Japanese Zeros, which had successfully defended against two American attacks, were still at very low altitude. On the flight decks of the Japanese carriers, crews had completed the refueling process. 
With virtually no opposition, the American bombers went into steep dives and delivered their bombs on the vulnerable Japanese carriers. The first bomb scored a devastating strike on the Kaga, engulfing it in flames. Fiery explosions also racked a second Japanese carrier, Nagumo's flagship, the Akagi. A wave of bombers from the Yorktown arrived on the scene and administered a similar fate to a third carrier, the Soryu. The fourth carrier, the Hiryu, having become separated from the formation, did not initially come under attack. Its planes launched their own attack on the American carriers, inflicting severe damage on the Yorktown. But American pilots hunted down the Hiryu in the afternoon and sank them. Even though the U.S. Navy lost the Yorktown to a Japanese submarine as she was being towed back to Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Midway was one of the most decisive victories of the war. Nagumo's entire carrier strike force, including four of Japan's six large carriers, had been annihilated in one bold stroke, greatly reducing Japan's ability to wage an offensive war in the Pacific. A leading writer at the time said of the Americans, they had no right to win, but they did. And in doing so, changed the course of the war. Well, thanks to the effort of Lieutenant Colonel Murray and others, this is what was prevented, according to military historian Paul Davis. He wrote, Japan in control of the majority of the Pacific Ocean would, of course, seriously affect the nature of today's world. How the Japanese would have fared in their continuing war in China, Southeast Asia, and the East Indies is problematic. China, if not conquered, would almost certainly have ended up in some way being subservient to Japan. Australia may or may not have been invaded or conquered, but Japanese control of the East Indies, Philippines, and Samoa would certainly have isolated the Australians and the New Zealanders. The Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, the projected economic domination of the Far East by Japan, would have been a strong possibility had the United States withdrawn from the war after a loss at Midway. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And in closing tribute to Lieutenant Colonel James Murray, I'm going to play the Air Force hymn as sung by the United States Air Force Academy Cadet Corral. Lieutenant Colonel Murray, we cannot repay what we owe you. Thank you for your service. Oh,